Do number seven. I think that there are four or five examples. We'll do number seven to begin with. And it says here, the operations manager of a light bulb factory wants to know if there's any difference in the mean life expectancy of two different types of bulbs. I guess made of two different machines. One machine and one process makes one type of bulb. If you take a sample of 25 bulbs now, the bulb lasts for like a few years. You can't just burn it out. Uh, well, that's where we put this. Uh, let's say, for example, you're trying to test a bulb that's supposed to last seven years. Think about it, seven years. This is an interesting, this has a, this is a more advanced statistical application right now. The bulb was made to last seven years. How do you test that? How do you prove to your, you know, the manufacturer or, the, or Home Depot that the bulb lasts seven years? Before they spend a million dollars buying 10,000 bulbs for you, they're gonna wanna test this. You can't test 1,000, uh, 25 bulbs, because how many, how many, how long will they last? How long will the test last if, it's, if the bulb lasts seven years? Well, if the, te the bulb really, last seven years, how long will the, the test last until they burn out? Seven years. Around seven years, maybe six, seven years, right? You can't, you can't stay in business taking tests, so what do you do? What do you think you would do if you have to manufacture, if you're manufacturing, you want to prove the bulb last seven years. How do you prove a, a bulb last seven years? But you don't want to wait seven years to do it. What? Put more energy into the bulb? Well, I wasn't even thinking that answer. That's probably one answer is that instead of doing 100 volts, 60 volts, whatever, 110 volts, you do 220 maybe just to see if you get more pressure and maybe there's a mathematical formula that says, well, if it's under 220, it lasts for two years, then 110 will last for seven years. So maybe, there's a, maybe that's a very good answer. I wasn't thinking that. I think they probably do that. They put them in really severe conditions. But that's what the answer that I was thinking. Anybody have another answer before I give you my answer? Which I think I learned in graduate school, but I'm not sure if I'm making this up. Yeah. Let's say you can use like a smaller amount of period. And then, uh, oh, say you burn it for, and what happens? Say you burn, yeah, you take 25 bulbs, you last for six months, and by the end of the six months, they're all still good. What do you do then? Wouldn't there be like a bulb that might burn out? Yeah, without a, okay, so you sort of got the right idea. What you do is you take not 25 bulbs, you take like 5,000 bulbs. Now, if a bulb has a normal distribution, and it's not like normal, it's called exponential, but that's besides the point. A normal distribution where the average bulb is about seven years, don't you think some bulbs burn out after six years? in five years, in three years, in two years, in one year, in six months. It's just natural, right? It's gonna be a belt, some, some will last for 11 years, as you probably know from your own experience. So therefore, you take like 10,000 bulbs, which for the manufacturer doesn't cost that much money, let them burn for about six months, and at the end of the six months, you say, four bulbs burnt out, you can then mathematically predict by the formulas we're learning about that the chance of 95% of the bulbs lasting more than seven years is like, you know, 80% or something like that. The point is you can do it with a large number, but that's, that's beyond this example. In this example, we're taking 25 bulbs that burn out after a short, like 375 hours. So one group of bulbs, 25, burns out at 375 with a standard deviation of 100. The other turns out, burns out after 362 hours with a standard deviation of 125, meaning some bulbs are 362 and some are 372, some are 322. They're all over the place with a standard deviation of 125. It says that the, at the 0.05 level of significance, we're using 0.05, assuming the population variance are equal, because we'll get into it perhaps on Friday during the review, you have to make certain assumptions about the formula and that the variances are roughly equal. Is there any evidence of a difference in the two groups of bulbs? By the way, I said before I was going to do a p-value problem. We're not going to, I can edit have time for that, but maybe we'll do it during the review. All right, so do we're doing number 10.7 part A. 10.7 part A. Now, the first difference is that we're not, the A0 is not simply mu equal some number or mu equal a different number. We're really making a relative statement of the two sets of bulbs. Group one, and this is from machine one. This is machine one. And this is, group number two is from machine two. Um, the two machines, are, the average is basically the same. Is group one and group two have the same average, not the same proportion, not the same variance, which are the more advanced questions. Are the, are the averages the same? Versus the alternative hypothesis, that they're not the same. We're not trying to prove one bulb is better than the other bulb, which would be another example, number number 40, number nine, and number 10, try to prove one is bigger than the other one. That's a different thing. But this, now we're dealing with the, you know, the two-tailed, the simple symmetric case. Step number two is to plug numbers into a formula, which we'll come to in a second. Step number three is going to be to make a T-diagram, which will come to in two seconds. And step number four is going to be to make an arrow indicating where you end up in the reject. So the basic structure is the same as before, which is why I'm able to teach it in two minutes. But uh, just a little bit of detail. So now, because we're dealing with two groups of numbers, 
It makes sense to compare one average versus the other average. In other words, how far apart are the averages? If this number is close to zero, if the two averages are similar, the A0 is true, which means the populations are similar, so the averages should likewise be similar. When you subtract them, they should be close to zero. Two similar numbers when you subtract them are close to zero. So we end up with close to zero means the except region is perfectly logical. The only complication is we also have two different standard deviations we have to put together, two different sample sizes sometimes. So what's the bottom part of the formula? The bottom part of the formula goes something like this. I hope I can. It's going to be n1 minus 1, the sample size of the first group, by, times the variance of the first group. The s1 is the standard deviation squared. To that, you add the sample size minus 1 of the variance of the second times the variance of the second group. You sort of average them together by n1 plus n2 minus 2. And this is further multiplied for mathematical reasons, which we'll get to on Friday, perhaps. 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2. It's a plus sign. Okay, so it's basically a lot of numbers to plug into the formula, but you get it after all is said and done with the calculator, you get the, the final answer. And that number is then compared to the t chart. So let's move on. So I'm just really out of time. Let me just go, I'll let, I'll let you calculate. I'll, I'll plug in the numbers and then we'll I'll let you do the calculation for homework unless somebody happens to know it. The numbers that we're using are, the first average is, the first machine is 375. The second machine, we're told, is 325, I believe. The sample size is 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, and 25. That place was three or six times there. And we're told the standard deviation is 100, so it's 100 squared, which really means that 10,000 goes over there. 100 squared and 10,000 goes over there. This number is 125 squared, or 125 and 125 is I don't know, like 150,000. So if you take all the square roots and everything, it sort of backs down to a normal size number. Anyway, the rejection region, of course, we're trying to prove that it's either bigger or smaller. We don't have a preference, it's non directional. We can make the rejection region both sides, which means in effect the alpha, which is 0.05, will be chopped in half. And this rejection region will contain 0 to 5 of the area. This rejection region is going to contain the other 2.5%. But and this is do not reject the zero. The degree of freedom can't be n minus 1 anymore because there's no n, there's two n's. But it turns out you add this degree of freedom plus this degree of freedom, and you get new degree of n1 plus n2 minus 2, which is the same as some of the separate degrees of freedom. In this case, it's 25 plus 25 minus 2, which is 48. And we said last time that the t number for, 40, not for 49 was 1.71. So it's got to be, can somebody please look it up? 48 with 0, 0.25 column. So probably 1.69, 1.70 there. No, I'm sorry, that was a 6. 1.2.0. 48. Yeah, what is it for 48? Uh, 2.0106. 0, 06 and minus 2.0106. Can anybody by any chance calculate the number here? I believe, but I can't swear to it. I remember from last year it came out to 0.39, but it's a big question mark. But whatever, if it is 0.39, then 0.39 is right here, which is in the acceptance region, so the final answer would be do not reject a zero. And the question originally was, is there any evidence of a difference? And the answer, no. In fact, that this number is 39, and therefore the answer is accept the A0, and therefore the answer, there is no difference between them, because the A0 claims there's no difference. They're both the same. It's pretty logical.